I'm sorry, Becca. Sorry, I was using the raise hand feature um, rather than my physical hand. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Cole. I teach first grade at Wyndham Primary School. I'm the president of Sebago East Shore Education Association representing Wyndham and Raymond. And I also represent Maine on the National Education Association Board of Directors. I am here this evening because um, a number of staff had indicated that it would be um, great if we could just offer some thanks and appreciation to members of the community who have uh, indicated support and um, good wishes as we all come back to instruction, whichever model um, one's family is participating in uh, as part of the new year. Certainly, we're really happy to be back with our students, um, but understandably, it's not without some degree of concern and trepidation. Um, wanting to make sure everyone remains healthy and that our kids can continue to access their education with us as, as best as they can. And so thank you to the members of the community who have offered that level of support. I also had a, um, a memo of gratitude, I guess um, you will call it, from staff at Jordan Small School for their administration supporting um, a day that they had before the um, break began where they were uh, supported to use the time to help kids catch up, to do um, engage in some activities together as a school community, and they just wanted to publicly express their thanks for um, their administrators supporting that opportunity. So thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we're now fortunate to have Mr. Hickey do a technology update. All right, uh, if this is going to be a tag team, uh, Christine frost A is going to be kicking it off. So this is a, a shared effort. Christine. Right, Bob, yes, thank you. I am sharing my screen and I'll head into presentation mode. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's a copy of this in your board packet um, this evening so that um, you can really, if you want to take a deeper dive after I present and Bob presents, um, you're welcome to do so. There are a lot of wonderful pieces in there that staff have shared to give you a glimpse into the world of technology in RSU 14 um, in the midst of COVID and some of the challenges and some of the wonderful tools that have emerged and uh, approaches to using technology in response to the pandemic. And we know that uh, Christine Hessler had presented on behalf of the curriculum committee earlier, and there were a lot of wonderful things shared about the use of technology, both from your in-person hybrid teachers as well as your remote teachers. So we don't wanna uh, replicate that same conversation that happened at an earlier board meeting. Tonight is really more about giving you a sense of um, some examples um, and then some links for you to go a little deeper should you choose to. Uh, we do have some staff members who I believe are joining us in this Zoom call. So when we get to the question and answer period, if board members have questions, um, we have some folks who might be able to um, answer those certainly more articulately and with greater depth than, than Bob or I could do as they're using the tech in their rooms on a daily basis. Um, so Bob and I um, talked about the focus of tonight's presentation. Uh, we really have two goals, one being to give you that snapshot of how tech has been used um, during COVID. And the second piece really is to recognize the extraordinary efforts of staff uh, to integrate technology um, during this really challenging time, as, as Becca just talked about. Um, it's been a lot for everyone, and this has required a tremendous amount of new learning um, and really thinking deeply about how we're going to uh, use this platform um, that we have. So, and, and then we'll talk a little about next steps. Those are really coming from, um, we have a, a group, an information technology steering committee that will be meeting monthly. Uh, there have been steering committees in the past related to technology. Uh, this group has some old members and some new members and representing special education, regular education, elementary, middle, high school, administrators, teachers. We really wanna make sure technology integrators, technology technicians. We wanna make sure that we really have multiple voices at the table and we think deeply about systemic work around technology. Oh, 
one second. So um, at Monday's meeting with the um, Information Technology Steering Committee, um, they shared a tremendous amount of information about how technology has been used. There are two focus areas that really emerged out of that discussion. One is around the teaching and learning um, aspect of technology. I'll be presenting about that. And then Bob is going to um, talk more about the infrastructure and system management side of technology, which is so critical. Um, but you'll see that I've um, bold faced and underlined the themes that came out of the, the meeting on Monday. The first is really new applications and tools. I'm sure you've heard of some of those. Um, and if parents are joining tonight or community members, um, they may be quite familiar with some of these as their children are using them on a daily basis. But we wanna give you some samples of that. Um, also thinking deeply about how technology can be used to enhance learner engagement, how we really hook students in through the use of technology in the 21st century. Um, we wanna give you a sense of what these digital platforms look like. You've heard about Seesaw, you've heard about Google Classroom. We wanna show you a little bit more. Um, so some staff have shared um, I'll present some slides to help you really see it. Um, we're going to talk a little about how it's used, how technology is used to provide targeted specific feedback to students. So many different ways we can provide meaningful feedback, which is um, one of John Hattie's, um, out of his research and meta-analysis of, of thousands of studies, um, feedback has a really high effect size, much like a coach on a soccer field or your piano teacher sitting next to you, um, helping you work through a new piece of music, feedback is critical. Differentiating instruction. So we wanna think not just in special education practice, but also in regular education, what we do to really uh, provide differentiated specific instruction to students, individual learner needs and responding to those needs. And then we'll talk a little about diverse texts and films. So how we're supporting staff to broaden, uh, expand their classroom libraries, to think deeply about a more um, global collection of text and film that we can use to teach, to engage learners. So they have um, that expansive view. We also have tremendous internal experts in this district. Teachers have been teaching teachers. I love that model. We have um, technology, integrators, as you know, we have library media specialists, we have the infotech team at the high school, lots of people uh, providing support um, so that people have what they need to use these tools thoughtfully. And then social emotional learning, we've talked about um, a lot as, as a board, um, as we've come together with you folks, and there's a role that technology has played as well in meeting the social emotional needs of our learners. And then lastly, writing, writing as it relates uh, in the 21st century to technology. Um, and so I'm not going to go in great depth with each slide, but I do wanna give you a sense of what you can explore. Um, this first slide is about the applications and tools and learner engagement. So I've broken the bullet from the previous slide down and each slide will give you a glimpse um, of what that looks like. So I'll start with Edpuzzle. This is a great example of how to engage students in listening and viewing while they're watching a video. And so rather than maybe old practice um, was, you watch the video and then we talk about it. Then I'm gonna ask you what you retained from the video, what you understood. We might have an activity in response after. Edpuzzle allows you to choose the video, and then throughout that, have stopping points with prompts and exercises, activities to really capture learner investment and interest throughout the entire viewing. So it's much more interactive. I'm gonna click on an embedded link that a teacher shared with us. We won't go through each of the slides, but this is also an example for you um, of how teachers are using Google Slides or, or PowerPoint presentations to really um, set up the lesson. 
So this is a study obviously of Asia, the, the largest continent in the world, um, going through all sorts of, of subtopics, weather and landforms and animals, et cetera. And when they get to the last slide, um, if in present mode, the teacher would click on this and have this set up so that they could be- Grammarly can help you write quickly and confidently. One second. So you Sorry. never have to slow down at work. Okay. This is Earth. Maybe you've heard of it. So they would walk through this National Geographic video and have these opportunities for students to engage at a much um, sort of a more active level of engagement than perhaps in the past. Um, so that's Edpuzzle. On the right here, we have a classic text many of us know about, and perhaps you even were able to meet Don Fendler at some point. Um, but Lost on a Mountain in Maine, this is a text that um, through the use of Zoom, something we've all become quite familiar with this year, um, a teacher has been able to bring in, um, you can see Todd Guttner, uh, the Channel 6 weather expert here. Uh, he did a reading today. Um, tomorrow, I believe, is a park uh, ranger from Baxter State Park will be joining via Zoom. So now we're able to connect people from around the state of Maine and have them zoom in, um, bring in their expertise in the area that somewhat relates to Lost in a Mountain of Maine, whether it's weather uh, or park management, the wilderness of Maine. Um, I'll be reading on Monday. Um, so they're zooming in, reading a chapter, answering some questions, participating with students through the use of technology. We could explode that beyond Maine and have people reading from around the world. Um, having guest speakers and, and no longer needing to have them drive to our school um, and, and come to us in person, which I, that still has certainly benefits, but this is a way to bring them in virtually. Um, the next category here was around the digital platforms you've heard a lot about. Um, Seesaw, as you know, has really been used at the younger grades um, so if you've never seen Seesaw, and if we have family members on tonight or community members, they might be quite familiar, but this is an example of how one classroom te teacher has set up Seesaw. Uh, you can see this is the cover page, welcome to the classroom. And if I click here, what she has done for you folks as board members um, is to be able to go through and see how, um, what Seesaw looks like and the different purposes um, of this, this digital platform. Um, and so she walks you through and has added some text to explain the different components. So you really can laser in a bit more. I'm not gonna go into great detail tonight, but I wanted you to be aware of, of what she's put together for you to better understand Seesaw. Oh. And on the right here, um, we also have, um, Emily Stokes has provided a, um, a digital narrative of understanding Google Classroom. And so I'll just press play here for a moment. Hello, my name is Emily Stokes. Um, I'm part of the fully remote team. I teach grade six ELA and social studies. Emily is going to walk you through um, how Google Classroom is used. Both of these platforms allow teachers to set up uh, organizational systems for students that certainly supports executive functioning skills and uh, managing assignments and really developing sort of how you're going to keep yourself organized. These are our great digital platforms for them to use. So Emily walks you through what Google Classroom looks like. Um, and I know you've heard a lot about that um, through the last, I'm sure several years, but certainly a lot this year. This next theme that I mentioned earlier is on feedback and the critical importance of providing targeted specific feedback to students. Um, Mike Levine has shared an example of how um, he has provided feedback to a student on a piece of writing. Um, not only can we, you can see here comments that the teachers inserted to support the student's revision process. And then there's a, a private comment to the student over really capturing a, a summary of uh, his, his review of that piece. But you can also provide audio feedback to a learner. So you could, you could be going through a piece of writing or an assignment, a project the student did and pre, be 
providing some um, oral narrative or summary or feedback for them to consider uh, really supports the revision process. This next area I mentioned, differentiated instruction. Um, Lorna Dunn has, um, she's a special education teacher and she shared two different versions of a digital notebook. Again, a way of using uh, Google Slides or PowerPoint slides to set your lesson up um, in a very organized way for students. On the left, you'll see this is the student version. And if you, if you click here, she's included the entire student version for you to review. But I, you can see one of the early slides clearly outlines the learning goal. They're focused on vocabulary. They'll be reading a junior scholastic article about meat. And um, the second learning goal is really supporting students with their ability to identify the main idea of an article and then find the supporting details. And so this is what the students seen. You see the battling burps article there, uh, the picture of the scientists strapping backpacks on cows to capture the methane in their stomachs. I'm sure students loved this lesson. And then on the right, over here, you can see the teacher version she included. So you see there's uh, lot red underlining going on. There's some blue underlining going on. And at the bottom of the slide, the teacher slide deck, there's a note here just reminding that this red portion is going back to that, that learning goal of supporting details and identifying supporting details. And so that um, she has versions there for you to see the entire lesson and how that's built to a really scaffold and support students who need that, that more intensive instruction. Moving on, um, diverse texts and films. So as, as Mr. Howell and I will be talking momentarily uh, when, when Bob and I are done with technology, um, we have been able to use some CRF monies, um, some of the COVID relief funds to purchase things that are um, in, on this slide about expanding uh, student and staff access to text and films. Um, I'd like to mention Sora or Overdrive. Um, that has just exploded our access to eBooks and audiobooks. Uh, we have Flipster digital magazines and Swank digital movies. Um, again, just getting more access out there, that conversation around diversity and equity and global texts and broadening perspectives. Um, certainly these, re these resources certainly support all of that. Swank um, supporting us with avoiding any kind of copyright infringement issues. Um, wonderful access to materials here. So you can see Joyce Babbitt, the library media specialist at, at Wyndham Middle School, uh, engaging learners in this picture um, in a book club discussion. Uh, lots of wonderful collections of texts here. Uh, great work happening to really get more out there into the hands of staff and students uh, and, and digital access as well. So um, for example, going back to the Todd Guttner Zoom session, um, you could, yes, you could read a book on Zoom, but you also now have the ability to access a digital book. So as you're engaging with students through Zoom, you're, you're clicking through the digital slides, just as I'm showing you uh, these slides um, right now. And the internal experts. So um, they're all over the district. We have, I'm blown away daily by the work that's happening, that's unfolding and, and the amazing creativity of the staff. Um, we're gonna focus in on right now the high school. I'd like to, uh, the Infotech team at the high school's really been doing a tremendous amount to not only provide resources throughout the year to staff, but also to students. Um, we talked earlier in the year, Christine Hessler talked about the modules that were developed last summer to support staff with this transition to um, a, a COVID style of schooling. Um, the, the Infotech team was uh, instrumental in putting that together. Um, they also have included some links here for you to peruse. I'm, I'm going to click on this first one. This is uh, what was provided to staff a wish book. And we have um, Infotech team members are on tonight. They can speak uh, more eloquently about this if you have questions, but you can flip through and see some examples 
of resources they pulled together to support staff, beautifully designed and a lot of information sharing in really creative ways. And then when I go back um, here, you can also see that they, they thought deeply about students. So this Infotech Place site, very different uh, style, you can tell. So this is geared to students and engaging them um, thoughtfully. Um, there's classroom research guides that they've put together, which um, really take into consideration the design and research process, uh, inquiry process, um, virtual book fairs, um, Google workspace updates, all sorts of wonderful things happening, information getting out there in, in um, tech savvy ways. Um, this slide's all about social emotional learning. Um, whoop, whatever that slide was, there we go. Um, staff have been creative, uh, thinking about how are we going to meet the social emotional needs of students and staff and each other um, but how do we do create community and support students when we don't see them as often, if they're in person hybrid only coming two days a week, or if they're on the remote team, but they don't have that in person sense of connectedness. And so Martha Stone has shared some examples with you of first what mindfulness education is. There's a link here for you to review. Um, she has a wonderful example of a mindful minute I'm going to click on. Um, just one minute of everybody taking a moment so we can kind of recenter ourselves. Oh, that won't work. What she has, and that's sorry, this is the, <laughs> the tech glitch. I wasn't ready for that. Um, it's it's a, a video clip of a river, a beautiful river. I don't know if it's near Martha's home. Uh, where she got the clip, I should, I should ask her that, but it's just a moment of watching the river. Um, and I'm sure there's some level of prompt you could give students, getting them ready to sort of take a moment, do some deep breathing, calm ourselves as we get ready for the next phase of the day. Um, so she also has done a tremendous amount with, with calming strategies and working with staff and, and the whole school. On the right here, you can see uh, the virtual, the remote team has invited anybody um, to participate in this virtual cooking club. You can see a, a screenshot of different students and staff joining together at, at the beginning. And I don't know if they always do this, but they play the theme song to the Great British Baking Show, which is one of my personal favorites. Gets everybody really excited. And they've had different challenges from cake baking, um, pasta dishes, all sorts of challenges. So the students come, uh, ready to go and at the end they present what they have created. Some more images for you to explore here. You can see Mr. Howell and Ms. Hessler have joined the staff and students. This was clearly a holiday baking challenge. Lots of fun. And the last theme um, for my piece is really writing in the 21st century. And so Melissa Bois um, pulled together some examples. Um, the blue are some links for you to explore more. But the three things she wanted to highlight, uh, Google Slides. Teachers are using Google Slides in a variety of ways. But when we think of writing, students, many students, I've, you know, from young writers, inexperienced writers, struggling writers to advanced, sophisticated writers, you can use slides to really organize your thinking and your writing um, and support the writing process to get you to the end product result. And so Google Slides have been used to really help with the, the planning and rehearsal of writing pieces to get you to the point of producing. Um, the co-writer, uh, there's a link here. This is a tool for students, primarily secondary, who might have deficits in spelling or vocabulary or sentence structure. This is a word prediction software, which is individualized to each student's writing structure. Uh, the more the student uses it, the more effective the, stop, the software becomes. And then um, on the right here, in uh, units of study, when we think of that uh, program that's, that's been implemented, um, there's a virtual license that has been purchased, which is allowing um, teachers and students and families to work on the units of study lessons. Um, there's some family videos here. Uh, this is a link for you to explore that a bit. 
and there's some more information around um, sort of how this virtual license can be used um, as a mentor text for teachers. Teachers can watch the lesson being taught um, and then help them prepare for lesson implementation. Um, all sorts of wonderful resources there for you to explore. Um, but all of this, uh, the teaching and learning work that's so critically important uh, wouldn't be possible without the RSU 14 technology technician team, Bob Hickey, um, the director, the network management aspect of this, the data management, the technology technicians and the help desk, keeping the infrastructure um, going, that it meets the needs of teachers uh, who are really working hard to implement and students uh, who are accessing all of this technology. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, technology director, Bob Hickey. Thanks so much, Christine. You did a fabulous job and you're a tough act to follow. And we are humbled. The whole tech department exists only to be a support mechanism for teachers, students, and especially in this difficult time of distance education, which has thrown new duties and new skills on everybody. And it's impressive that everyone's come through it so masterfully. So uh, these are the categories that I'm going to talk about in more details in my slides as we go through. Technology was put in place or upgraded to support the new distance learning model. Devices and devices were made for teachers and students out remotely, whether they're a couple days a week remotely through hybrid or full-time remote. Uh, COVID expenditures were leveraged to maximize technology tools both on and off campus. We tried to be efficient with all the resources that we were quite frankly blessed with, uh, with additional monies this year. Infrastructure was upgraded on our campus to support more streaming and distance access for hybrid and distance students. And then I'm gonna talk about internet safety and critical safety systems and the help desk and communications. So the first thing is we support the backbone that the teachers leverage every day. So we've had Google Suite for, now known as G Suite, uh, for quite a few years. This year, we've gone to G Suite Enterprise, which is a, a increased cost. The, uh, the G Suite was free for schools, G Suite Enterprise. And the point in that was to give additional meet capabilities to teachers. Oops, if we could back up a little, thank you. Um, so we have a maximum 250 people who can connect there is uh, plagiarism software that would take the place of turn it in. There's administrative tools within G Suite Enterprise. So we have done this in order to support the teachers and students better as they leverage these tools like the whole Google Suite now known as Google Workspace in the last month or so they renamed and as well as Google Education, Google Classroom. Okay, next one, please. Okay, and we also support Google Meet, uh, this shows you, you know, how busy it can get when you get that many people, everybody gets smaller and smaller. Next one, please. And then we also support Zoom, which you're on now, everybody's familiar with that. So what's interesting is that we have, you have taken tools and are accommodating personal learning styles. You're doing SAMR all electronically. You, with the uh, Infotech team has got library resources. So it's amazing that everybody's pulled together, students, families, teachers, everybody, in order to give the students remotely what they need and the teachers what they need. And I know it's been a huge learning curve. <clears throat> teachers have done masterfully. Sometimes they, it's the te teacher training, training the teacher. Sometimes it's outside resources. It's phenomenal what you come up with for resources and you're really addressing the students' needs. So now I'm gonna talk about end user devices that are out in the field talking not only to the web, but back to our infrastructure. So we purchased 221 iPads for K and one this year. We were finally able to leverage one-to-one -one iPads this year at the K one level. For the last few years, we've had one-to-one -one devices, but it's been a mismatch. We've had, you know, five devices per classroom, five iPads per classroom. The first year we bought them, another five, the next year, another five, we got to 15. Then rather than go 20 and then push that out another year before we get to roughly a full size class, uh, full class, we pushed that together this year. And now we have one-to-one -one iPads and K and one. So we have 
one-to-one -one K-12. We have 32 iPads that were purchased to support the brand new pre-K program. Those are two classrooms together in Raymond. They share a cart, so we efficiently, efficiently leveraged cart resources as well. We're waiting on final input and resources from the state on what they're gonna do with grade seven and eight and the new MLTI 2.0. The rumor mill is rampant, but we don't really have an answer yet. So we're kind of holding in abeyance what their decision might be. Are they gonna support specific devices? Are they gonna turn money over to schools? We're not quite sure yet. So we'll keep everybody in the loop on that. Uh, special ed and high school library got iPads and Apple pencils. The uh, Apple pencils are terrific for the special ed staff in terms of some of the assessments they have to do with the students. We purchased laptop cases. There was an initiative at the lower grade level to have devices available for families to take at home. As everyone knows, we've never had that in the past. Uh, young students have kept their devices at school. The, the breakage will probably go up, but it gives us the flexibility and ability to better serve those students as they're off campus. Next, please. Uh, COVID expenditures. Here's how we leverage those efficiently. We've purchased OWL cameras, Logitech cameras for classrooms, uh, document cameras, microphones, sound systems. And so an OWL camera, you can see the picture, it looks like an OWL. And what's nice about this is it takes away the need for somebody to manage the camera. So there's eyes on the front, eyes on all four sides. You can actually walk around the table in a room and this can track you. The projectors were purchased to support on-premise hybrid classes. Uh, we have 45 external monitors that we bought for teachers to have offsite so they can watch the kids in one screen, watch the lesson and deliver the lesson in the other. This is uh, Mr. Mullen. He works at the middle school. He also does a lot to support Manchester and a lot of the other schools. I wanted to put in the, the tech heroes. We have the teacher heroes and everyone else. And I just wanted to bring home the folks from behind the desk and introduce them. So we purchased 845 MacBook Airs this year for grades four, five, and six. Unfortunately, they didn't land till mid-year, so it's hard to distribute those middle of school year. So we're doing the best we can. We desperately needed a spare pool and they're filling that need. Uh, we're leveraging them as dual devices in certain areas where a teacher needs a second device for the classroom and the monitoring of students. Out of the 845 MacBook Airs, 760 of them were student devices and 85 were staff. As we all know, there's roughly 250 students per grade in the district. COVID expenditures were leveraged to maximize technology again, and these are BenQ boards, which probably many of you have heard of by now. They're interactive board. It's a, a digital TV. It takes the place of a projector because the TV takes the place of that. It's interactive. You can touch the screen. It takes the place of the Apple TV and it has a built-in sound bar. So you get rid of all the other equipment that the teachers have had to use. And one of the really strong points of the BenQ is it's not just anchored to the classroom. The students can have software installed on their remote device and can participate in the classroom that the teacher is showing on the interactive BenQ board. So we're leveraging great tools. Uh, shout out kudos to Christine Pertney who really uh, fought to get the money for a lot more of those in district and it was great. Infrastructure. So with the massive amount of streaming that's going on, clearly bandwidth has been challenged. So we have increased by double 100% at the high school. We've gone from one gig to two gig to serves the main campus. A 250% increase from 400 meg to one gig for Raymond schools, both fed off of uh, Jordan Small connection and a 500% increase at Manchester go from 200 meg to one gig. And that's Mark Politano, our network administrator. He's new this year. He's done a great job. I'm sure a lot of you've seen him around the district. Okay, our firewall was updated because the old one wouldn't allow the speed increases we needed for the new bandwidth to be connected. So we've gone from our former uh, one gig connection to the internet up to a maximum of 10 now. We're currently only allocated two but we needed to have the ability to have a handoff of up to 10 before uh, main school and library network would give us the increased bandwidth. Now, I know in the future, there'll be no 
increase of equipment, they'll just turn up the data dial as they give us more allocation. We have a core fiber switch that feeds from the main drop point at the high school to the remote buildings. And it also links up to the closets in the high school. That was really hurting. And so we made an increase in speed there. We've gone a tenfold or a thousand percent uh, increase in speed from one gig to 10 gig within the building between the closets and the closets service an area of the building. So you'll have an electrical closet with switching that serves one wing or an, a major area of the building. So that's important to have those talking to each other quickly so there's no bottlenecks and then get out to the internet. Uh, this follows recent similar upgrades in the high school and primary school. We, we did these within the building closet to closet upgrades in Manchester and, and Raymond schools this year. We held off purposely on the middle school because as we all know, we're getting a new middle school. We didn't want to spend infrastructure money on bolstering a school that is somewhat on the short list. But if we get to a desperate situation where it needs to be, we'll do that. But we're trying to be efficient with resources and not spend that. There's Austin Carr. He does technology up in Raymond. Austin has thrown himself into our iBoss website filtering that allows us to filter both students and staff on campus and off campus. So when the device leaves, we're not flying blind and people don't have protection. We're gonna switch from our current iBoss solution we've had for a few years. It works pretty well. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. But we're gonna to switch to Cisco Umbrella, which we can get through MSLN for free from the state. So we're gonna do that and roll that out over the course of the summer. Uh, we've intentionally moved a lot of our critical systems to the cloud. You've all heard of ransomware. We all know what happened to SAD6 and other major companies. So most of our most critical functions are out in the cloud. And the reason we do that is that the cloud's not necessarily safer, but when you put your data in the hands of a lot bigger vendor that can afford a lot more storage, a lot more backups, because when your data is encrypted, the only cure is to roll back to before that was encrypted. So they can afford much bigger, better backup systems and more often than we could ever afford. So we're leveraging that. Uh, we, oops, we go back a little bit. And we use uh, Dato, which is our program that we back up our local servers to the cloud. And if our server room was to ever burn down, we could run from their servers in the cloud. VMware virtual servers are being upgraded as well. Uh, help desk and communications. There's Dave Steigel. He's our help desk man and he does an excellent job, as does everybody. Uh, I'm really humbled by all the people I get to work with, uh, educational and tech folks. So we have very old Nortel systems in most of our buildings. In the last few years, we've upgraded the primary school in Manchester to a newer Mitel phone system. And I'm working with Bill. We're trying to see if we can get the high school converted. Uh, we leveraged our phone system to offer some additional privacy to the teachers so that they could dial in to our phone system and then dial out. We have uh, a bank of 24 phone lines in one bundle. It's called a PRI. So each of those two PRIs has 24 phone lines each, one in the high school, one in the middle school. And uh, PRI stands for primary rate interface. They're just digital lines. And this allows teachers to dial in and dial out without giving up their personal information from their cell phone or home phone. Next, please. Okay, communications. We've put Wi-Fi hotspots in the hands of many students throughout the districts. We have devices from AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. And we did that to support students who don't have internet or have substandard internet or have bad coverage. And we've targeted this towards economic uh, challenges because we didn't want everybody to just get free internet and shift that burden of payment to the district. So to be responsible, we said, well, you know, if there's an economic challenge, that seems to be more fair. So uh, Mrs. Bricks, I would not let me go home if I didn't put this particular colored bar chart up every year. And so in the past, this has been a little bit more helpful than it is tonight. So it showed us how many devices we have where, but we, we know that we have one-to-one -one now. So you can see the first Top four lines are about mostly iPads. Um, and so they're uh, in the K1 area. And then the new iPads that we purchased in the current fiscal year. And then you can see there was, uh, 
I should have made it a dark pink line. The lower left MacBook Airs one to one in grade nine, they got moved up to the, well, it's below the two yellow and the orange, that light pink, it should have been a dark pink because that's those devices that got moved to the high school at that time. So this gives folks an idea of what we have where, where we've shifted, where we've been efficient and reutilized. We still don't know what the state's gonna do uh, on the gray and the second to last line towards the right for seventh and eighth grade, but really that's the only wild card. And so we had targeted the upgrade of four, five, and six, because as you can see in this inventory list, those were our oldest devices. That's why we picked funding updates for four, five, and six. Thanks, Christine. Now, do you want to take over next steps? Sorry, Bob, my mouse was running away. Oh, no, but you did fine. I didn't mean to have those slides skip on you. Um, thanks, Bob. Um, so certainly uh, two major focus areas for us as an information technology steering committee, the staying grounded in the teaching and learning work, obviously critically important, but we need to be uh, very much collaborative with the infrastructure side and have those conversations going back and forth. Um, a lot to consider. So next steps, uh, we will be needing to make a decision about some of the tools and resources that we purchase with CRF funds um, to support teaching and learning this year. We need to think about what are we doing moving forward? So there's some budgetary uh, conversations that need to happen related to those new tools. Um, we do have a group piloting uh, Hapara, which is an extension for Google Classroom to monitor students' desktops and seamlessly alert them when they have a missing assignment. This has been, uh, this is really in response to some feedback from families where they don't really know if something's missing or there's that disconnect. Um, we have some folks piloting to see if this will help solve some of those challenges. And then the, the steering committee is going to focus on developing a tool to assess the quality of applications and tools to see, you know, are they really designed to deepen learning, to um, heighten engagement, and how are they aligned to the ISTE standards, the International Society for Technology and Education? Are they aligned? Um, are they valid, reliable, quality tools? And, and to have also a, a systemic scope and sequence, if you will, for technology standards and integration. We're going to continue that conversation uh, that's happened in prior years and keep that work going uh, so we can really be supporting staff. Um, so those are some next steps. And now, as I said, um, Ms. Cummings, we do have a bunch of folks who helped either send slides, information, resources, they've given input. Um, so if the board has questions, uh, if you're okay, if they raise their hands, if they're willing to share, they might have some other insights. Of course. I will Un zoom us. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Does anyone have any? First, I want to say excellent presentation, both of you. What good information that you shared. And um, I especially like to see, of course, all the things I can click on for um, information about what's going on in the schools. I, I really appreciate that. I did have one question. If if, if no one else. Um, and that was, um, Bob, when you were talking about the G Suite and you said that it had a max of 250. In right, for one Google Meet. Okay, so yeah. that didn't mean a max of 250, period. That's for each, each Google, Google Meet. Meet. Yep. Okay. All right, thanks. That was all I had. Um, Christina Small? Um, Bob, I want to thank you for bringing up the ransomware. I was going to ask that question. So uh, my understanding of, of what you said in your presentation was that we moved uh, some of our critical infrastructure to Dato to protect us if we were to hit, be hit by ransomware at somewhere else. Is that correct? Well, um, uh, we moved our um, finances and a lot of our critical, like Google is all in the cloud. Sure. So as far as the core data, it's there where somebody can back it up better. Dato is for backing up our local servers. And then if we had a fire in our network room, those local servers could run from virtualized copies in the cloud. Let me just continue on, Bob. So Christina, back to your question. I think it was two years ago that um, RSU 14 and MS86 were hosting all their own financial data 
uh, through ENCODE and unfortunately MS86 and I think also City of Augusta, who was also a Tyler, um, had their systems hijacked by ransomware. And so we made the decision at that time that we would move all of our financial data, which includes quite a bit of personal information about all of our staff that's held within our payroll software over to Tyler Technologies. They host it, they're responsible for the security and um, they are definitely much more sophisticated than we are and whatever we can do with our, so our data lives with them. We have a individual pathway, Bob, correct? That we can then log in and work off their software. But if something were to happen, uh, it's on Tyler and not on us. Okay, so I guess then my question would be about Tyler and do we know if they have some sort of guarantee that we would not be locked out of anything that we would get that information back? Um, I know these days some companies have insurance for that type of thing and they just pay uh, just just to get to, to keep whatever organization moving. I don't know what um, if you folks happen to know what that process is for our particular data. Sure. Well, Christina, they bought, Tyler isn't just one company, it's like 50 companies, they bought so many. And one of the companies they bought was a security company that was over in South Portland, I can't remember the name of it now. So they have dedicated um, security staff and they sell their own, I can't, I can't remember the name of their product, but it's uh, Tyler Defend or something like that. And then what it does is it comes with AI looking for trouble. And then if it, any of the flags go off, their security folks will look at it closer. We looked into it, it was pretty expensive. We didn't really feel we needed to go to that expense. Uh, Tyler has our data in the cloud, so they know they're responsible to give it back to us. I don't think we really need to spend a lot of money to get to that point where we would get our data back. Um, and to be quite honest, Pretty much every major company I can think of has been compromised. Microsoft, Google's had trouble in the last few months. Uh, LinkedIn, I mean, you name it, they've all had trouble. So I don't really think for financials, we really need to spend a lot of money doing beyond what we're doing for our data to be restored because they know it's on their server, it's virtualized. We tunnel through kind of like uh, you would with your bank. And so it lives on their end. They know they'd have to give it back to us if something happened to it. So really we put the onus on them of multiple backups over a long period of time. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Mrs. Britz? You're muted, Kate. Yes, she's... She's working on it. Oh, sorry. I think she has to come back to this. Um... This earth, right. Um, first of all, this was highly impressive for me and extremely um, helpful not having students in the school that you provided um, the applications that I'm hearing about so much, but I really don't have firsthand knowledge of. So I'm extremely appreciative for that. I think it was really a superb presentation. A um, Couple of questions. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the volume for the help desk from parents and students. And if, well, I'll leave it at that. Sure. If, you're, if, it, if it's gone down or if there are recurring themes from the help desk. No, there are definitely recurring themes. Kate, thanks for bringing that up. What we try to do is if it's an application that we're responsible for and they're locked out, we work with that. If they need a password, we work with that. We try to delineate the line where we're not doing home support. Sometimes folks have a horrible internet connection. We'll make recommendations, do a speed test, reboot, reboot your router. But we try not to get across that line into home support because that would be just too voluminous. Right, right. Um, but Kate, on the, on the other hand, um, with the remote team, the middle school staff, for example, no, there were some questions coming up and very much the same themes of uh, parents struggling. And so they hosted another parent night for any parent who wanted to come. And Richie Vickers, Emily did a workshop on a topic that t uh, parents were struggling trying to navigate infant and campus and Google Classroom. So I think Bob's team takes care of one piece. And then I've been so impressed by staff saying, yeah, let's just do another parent night and parents who need a, you know, 
a workshop, they're willing to do that at, at the level of the, what the parents needed. So. And that's, that's something that's something we're continuing to do. We have our next one already set up for um, with our guidance department from around the district. There, we're doing that at the end of the month and reaching out to parents on that. So that's something, especially with the technology piece, that we are really trying to assist with parents um, and with students. Um, and it's parents have been extremely supportive. It's been amazing. That's great. Um, what about damage? Have you had a lot of reports? A lot of these. If you're hybrid, your devices at home, have you had an uptick in damage in devices? Well, we have had an uptick, but it doesn't seem to be overwhelming. I mean, we clearly have a lot more devices home. We have devices home with younger kids. We're doing things we never did before. And then if it looks like it's problematic where it's recurrent, maybe even intentional, sometimes we take away the MacBook Air and give them a Chromebook. I mean, we just can't keep giving them new machines if they're not gonna take care of them intentionally. Um, I know you addressed it a bit in your presentation, but what don't you have that you need? Um, honestly, I would have to run that past Chris and the A-team for priority. I've been really well taken care of. I'm appreciative of the board, administrators, senior and middle administrators, teachers, staff, students, everybody, tech department. We've really been building the infrastructure as you've seen over the last several years with E-Rate where we get half the money back anyway. So we've been making leaps and bounds forward. So we're doing pretty well, Kate, but I appreciate the offer. Kate, if I can just jump in though, uh, we have what Bob, six or seven tech staff members who are serving um, over 500 staff plus 3,200 students plus all the different families, um, they are out straight looking to support us and try to give us the best service. So um, if you were to look, if we were a company with that many users, our tech department would be much larger. Um, and so staffing is always an issue. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. Well, the one thing that strikes me um, other than the superb effort on everyone's part is and I don't know whose quote this is, but necessity is the mother of invention. And it just strikes me when I see all of these innovative things that we're doing now, if there's a um, positive to our experiences, it's that we've expanded our opportunities perhaps for students and um, have learned a lot about technology. And I think that's a good thing. So um, bravo to everybody, thank you. Thank you. Pete? All right, thank you. Bob, we've talked about ransomware tonight and the steps that we've taken to protect against the ransomware uh, by moving that to Tyler. What are we doing for like the individual devices in terms of protection? Uh, because I have heard of uh, multiple students this year. I don't know that it's a huge number, but um, at least a few students whose devices have been locked down because of suspicious activity in the background, uh, whether it be attempted hackers. Uh, so what do we use to protect the devices? Well, um, we use semantic for antivirus, anti-malware, but honestly, Pete, it's it, beyond that. It's This gets into the IBOS web filtering. And then sometimes folks, students, staff, they get into areas of you know questionable websites and so their device will be locked down until it can be brought in, scanned, and then further researched. And then the parent or student will be talked to. Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes you click on an advertisement or something and it takes you somewhere else and then it downloads something in the background you don't even know. If you have multiple hits for something all within the same minute, that doesn't really look like regular traffic. But then sometimes if somebody's going to a proxy to bypass our server, our, our security and get around it, that's intentional. So, you know, we're dealing with both. So sometimes Pete, when people are locked down, it's along that line. It's not just the software is locking them down. We're locking them down on purpose. I think the other thing- Yeah, to, oh, go ahead, Chris. The other thing to add to it, Pete, and I, maybe the public knows it, maybe they don't. I think some kids have figured it, have now understood it. Uh, but for all of our student and staff machines, all the web traffic actually comes back through our servers and our filters. So even if you're home working off your home network, 
that traffic goes from your home network back through our servers and then out to the web. So those filtering devices are there. So sometimes people think that just because they're on a home network that they're now off, but if it's one of our devices, then that web traffic's continuing on through our protections. All right, good. I was just curious if there might be any kind of uh, stronger protection that we could direct resources to if that was the issue or, uh, but it sounds like that might not be the issue. Mm -hmm. Do we have anybody else who would like to ask a question? Well, I want to thank everyone. Oh, sorry, Christine. Sorry, Janie, I just wanted to, again, I wanted to express um, in response to Kate's comments and some of the others, uh, the folks who are joining tonight and many others who sent things, they really pulled all these wonderful resources together for you. So. I, I'm so appreciative of them. They, they blow me away. Um, if you do, if you have time to explore some of them a bit more, I know they'll be appreciative because there are a lot of wonderful nuggets embedded within that presentation in your packet. So thank you to all who joined tonight too. They really are remarkable. Thanks, Jenny. I was just about to say everything she said <laughs> because it's really true. We do appreciate the efforts that you have made and Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you're doing to support our children. Okay, let's move on then. Thanks, Bob. And um, to the, car, the CRF fund project updates. Yeah, so it's been wonderful to hear. And also just wanna echo Amy and Tammy, and I think Joyce is on this call as well. Um, just thank you for all that you've done and, your, and honestly, your enthusiasm and um, some of the the opportunities that you've mined and really have gone through that process of figuring out what's beneficial to us uh, has been absolutely amazing. And so thank you. But again, all these things come with a price tag. And so board members, all the things that you're hearing tonight and even members of the public, um, I'm sure you're wondering how we've actually been able to pay for all of this as we've gone through this process. And so I've got a couple slides to share. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, I didn't want to do share. I wanted to do present, there we go. So working through Corona Relief Funds, which has really been the mechanism that we've been able to pay for all this. And just, I think it's important for the board to know and important for the public to know that uh, Maine is one of the, not all states actually went after Corona Relief Funds for their schools. Uh, and Maine was one of those states and our commissioner, Pender Macon, uh, and our governor were fierce advocates for making sure that schools had the funds that they needed in order to be able to open and open safely. Uh, but it has been an extremely short period of time that we've had to be able to spend these funds. And I certainly would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, Christine frost uh, because she has taken over writing all the different applications for this and doing all the updates. Uh, and Stacy Webster and our accounts payable um, for keeping track of all the costs for this because uh, in a short period of time, so July to December 30th, the district was allocated about $5 million that had to be spent on Corona related um, items, items specific to opening school. And I think the other caveat that uh, people often forget is none of these items could be items that the district had already budgeted for. This was never meant to be a revenue replacement. It was meant to be what is it that you need? And so July 17th, we had the announcement. August 31st, we had the application due for CRF1. October 15th, we had a second round and we didn't even know that a second round was gonna come. And then as the board and the finance committee is very aware, uh, December 30, all funds CRF1, CRF2 had to be committed and spent. And um, at this point, um, we have until January 31st to draw down any remaining invoices for that. There is rumor, which I'll share in the next steps that um, we may be able to have a bit of a continuance with some of the funds. But going into the application, uh, CRF1, we received $2.4 million and I'm gonna go through what that was targeted towards and then CRF2, $2.5 million. So a significant investment by the state into funds to help us support 
um, our guiding principles for spending. Number one, first and foremost, health and safety of students and staff members. Uh, and I will tell you, this is when it is wonderful to have a professional engineer on staff with Bill Hansen, who has an understanding of um, HVAC systems and the importance of HVAC and the importance of getting fresh air into spaces and promoting turnover uh, because a significant number of funds actually went into that and to have somebody who could professionally lead that. Um, to then look at opportunities for in-person or remote instruction. Um, we know that that's continuing to go on through this year. We also looked at long-term investments to improve environmental and safety conditions in RSU 14 um, buildings and grounds. Um, we're hoping that the pandemic ends in 2021 and that what we have purchased and what we've used through CRF that we'll be able to use them as long-term investments. Uh, and then also there's a reality side where um, we know that this year is gonna be a difficult year financially for the district and for the state given lost revenues. Um, are there funds and things that we can be spending now that might save us from having to do expenditures in the future? So, kind of spread these into the categories that were in, in COVID-2 and Christine, please jump in as we go down through this. Um, so first of all, student supports with technology, um, much of what you just saw within Christine and Bob's um, presentations, CRF1, it was 124,000, CRF2 was over a million dollars that was spent in technology. And through that, we we're able to purchase those uh, MacBook Airs that Bob talked about, supporting remote teachers, the OWL cameras, the BenQ. Uh, but then looking at what are the oldest computers within our, um, the fleet that we have, which will save us when we come to budget, it will remove an expenditure that we would have been up to replace those items in next year's budget. Uh, so looking to that, that forward thinking. Uh, another super important one, CRF one, $359,000 in temporary staff. Um, I've talked to the board about the long-term substitutes, temporary kitchen staff, temporary nurses. We had hoped to pull in some temporary custodians. That was something we found very difficult. We were able to hire one nurse, uh, but the long-term substitutes have been invaluable uh, and they have been able to um, be used in the buildings. They're also the reason why uh, to date that we've been able to keep buildings open. And some of the cases where we've had quarantines or in some cases where we have individuals that now have to go to remote instruction uh, that we've been able to use and cover with those long-term substitutes. And then other things that within here within CRF2, uh, if you think about it in Becca's first grade classroom or Jody's classroom, uh, who are on this call, uh, instructional supplies in the past where you could have kids share scissors and colored pencils and all the other things and crayons in a classroom, there's no sharing. Everybody needs their own individual box, their own individual supplies. Uh, and so being able to then purchase those, uh, also being able to support some additional noontime monitor at RES to help support with lunches because lunches are happening in the classroom, not happening in a cafeteria. And then some very specific professional development for Lisa for writing all these individual remote learning plans and being able to use Drum and Wood some, for some help with that. Uh, going into some other staff supports, uh, professional development, helping to support some of the work we did at the beginning of the year to open up school, um, special education, professional development, uh, an important investment, and I've included a picture there, contact tracing for transportation department. We now have purchased some technology through Tyler. Tyler's the one that does our GPS tracking, but now every bus will be equipped with a tablet. That tablet can move from bus to bus but as bus drivers are picking up students, they can actually take attendance. Right now we're doing that paper and pencil. Uh, think about the times now that we've been doing quarantining with or trying to do figure out contact tracing, who needs to quarantine. Bus drivers were looking for that paper attendance. Now it's an electronic that we can actually have instantly uh, in order to be able to do that. It also improves our routing software. It improves the GPS capability of our buses. Uh, and so an investment there. Um, outdoor classroom safety and emergency response. We have purchased some additional gators. Uh, we have classrooms that are outside and we need to get nurses and the SRO and other people out to remote places more quickly. Uh, and then I think um, 
one of the things that Bob talked about with purchasing technology for remote teachers. Think about it now, we have 20 plus, so it's actually 30 plus people now who are teaching from home. Uh, it's important that they have the proper ergonomic uh, equipment, furniture, chairs in their home so that we make sure that we're not doing repetitive injuries while we're there. Um, postage, we're sending a lot more things via the mail. Uh, I love these pictures. The one on the left there is from RES outside the art room. Um, some great pieces of art that have been done with masks. And of course, the, the wonderful eagle in front of Wyndham High School, uh, <laughs> properly equipped with some PPE uh, to make sure that that eagle is safe. So speaking of PPE, uh, CRF1, we spent $492,000 in uh, health and safety signage. Uh, additional school supplies, plexiglass desk barriers for classrooms. I know board members, you've been through the buildings. We put up, uh, I say we, um, we contracted to have over 8,000 signs put up across the district for social, for social distancing, for traveling, to make sure that kids are going uh, where they need to be to be taking care of traffic for our indoor and outdoor. Um, time for Printing, who worked with us, I love the bottom picture there for the Raymond Schools, um, for Jordan Small, the Roadrunner, for RES to be able to do the Raven on everything, uh, and then everything on the Wyndham side of the house had the Eagles. Um, and then this pallet here, that was our first pallet of PPE that came from the state, uh, and we're thankful for PPE that arrived. Uh, however, we still needed to purchase some additional uh, PPE, so over $161,000 in PPE. Uh, and then also, uh, we're routinely fogging off hours, desks, common areas, buses, vans, anywhere a kid can go, anywhere a hand can go. Uh, we are regularly, uh, not only we're cleaning them every day, we're regularly having somebody come in and putting an antimicrobial, antiviral agent on those items. Um, air handler system, CRF1, uh, almost 1.2 million. Actually, I think this is gonna grow a little bit with CRF2. Uh, Wyndham Middle School cafeteria and the Wyndham Middle School STEM room, including the Wyndham Middle School office, never had real ventilation. They had heaters, there was never a fresh air source. Ventilation upgrades at WPS, um, also some ventilation upgrades at um, RES. We've upgraded all of our filters to what's called a MERV 13. That's the highest filtration that you can go. Um, the little unit ventilator, that picture down in the lower right, uh, Bob has worked with mechanical services and um, an environmental engineer. We have over doubled the amount of fresh air that's coming into our classrooms through the old unit ventilators at Wyndham Middle School. Uh, and then off to the left-hand side, everywhere we could, touchless faucets have been put in the district uh, with 10-year batteries. So 10 years from now, we're either gonna be replacing them or doing a whole bunch of batteries uh, at that point. But uh, to be able to do that long-term uh, support, also purchasing two-way radios. I mean, think about all the people now that are out in outdoor classrooms and moving. Everyone should have a radio. Everyone should have the ability to call the office. Um, we bought, what, Christine, over 100 radios through this process. And then CRF2, some of the maintenance and plant things. So outdoor classrooms, there are now eight additional outdoor classrooms um, that are pavilions with the covered structures. Uh, in addition, some of the outdoor classrooms with some of the wooden structures and a major upgrade to the walking trails out behind Raymond Elementary School. and. Um, that little picture in the upper right is a new bridge out in the RES trails, uh, which will allow for access um, in an emergency. We can actually get a gator down there or a truck down through there if something were to happen on the trails. Um, District-wide HVAC controls, bottle filling stations, because you have to turn off the water fountains. Um, communication to meet safety guidelines. So again, some more radios, school cleaning equipment, uh, we have bought 25 new floor scrubbers so that our custodial time is um, actually more efficient. School access points with more people going outside. There's more need to have more places where you can come in and out. So those card readers. 
And then something that probably the boards never hasn't thought about or the public doesn't think about, we're not having the public in after hours into our buildings. Uh, and that's caused some, some um, pressure onto adult education to find other places. And so um, they've been renting in the community for places for classes to have them, classes that they can't have in their building. Transportation, transportation has been a major investment between CRF one and CRF two. Uh, we've purchased two buses, six vans, two cargo vans for mobile meals and most recently a refrigerated truck for mobile meals. Uh, what this will mean though, is that for this year and this year's budget, we will not have to purchase buses and we will not have to purchase vans. Um, so being able to make that long-term investment Transportation, uh, the board is very aware of this minimum of, or actually a maximum of between 26 and 30 kids on a bus. So we've had to increase the number of buses. We've had to change our routes. Uh, we've had to increase the number of vans because now instead of having four kids in a van or three kids in a van, it's either one or two um, if they have an aid. So going on to our meals, and I know I'm talking quickly, but there's a lot of info here. Those vans, I'm sure that you've seen them out about in town. And um, we, uh, underneath the waiver that we have, we're able to provide a significant um, service to the community. And um, we, actually I say we, I think it was Christine and Christine and Jeannie um, worked the day before people left for the holiday break. I think there were close to 3,600 meals that were delivered on that one particular day. Uh, and the, the, having a refrigerated truck and the refrigerated truck basically looks like one of these vans that just has a little refrigerator unit on the top. Uh, but in addition in the buildings, um, we've needed additional cooler bags, food distribution carts with eating in the classroom, uh, nutritional programming supply and equipment needs. So uh, things to be able to package food, more packaging for foods because everything has to be done single serve. There's no more gang serving of things or plate service. Everything's in a nice little container, uh, which has some increased costs. So next steps. <clears throat> right now, we are in the final processes of uh, taking all of our invoices to make sure that we're doing our January 30 drawdown. I did hear a rumor today that um, whatever funds that we did not expend that there's a possibility that we'll be able to have up until June 30 to be able to hold on to those funds and to be able to continue to spend that. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second and go back to full screen. That's significant for us because um, if we remember, and I, maybe we shared this with finance, but not the full board, uh, we had costs such as, uh, do you remember the, the vote that you did for JAMP for the Apple MacBooks? where we were able to purchase some of the licenses, but then we went ahead and financed because we couldn't spend beyond December 30th. So now the subscription costs we could possibly now capture, uh, which was a significant finance. Any of those programs that uh, Christine shared with you, those licenses are only paid or were paid through the end of the month. Now with that extension, we can continue to pay those throughout the end of the year. Uh, so we should have some more information later on this week. Uh, in addition, uh, I'm sure all of you were closely following. Actually, I know you were because you were texting me and emailing me about it. Um, the Stimulus Act that was just recently passed and the additional CARES funds that were allocated to the state of Maine. We've not received our allocation. It's anticipated we will receive four times what we received in CARES 1, and that was 330,000. So I'm anticipating somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 million that will be allocated to the district. The timeline on that is that we will have until looks like 2023 to expend those funds. Uh, so it may be something that looking at um, where we are with some of these subscriptions that have been additions to the budget, that we hold that into reserve and that we use that to pay in the forward so it's not going to end up impacting the budget for next year uh, as a possibility but I hope to have some information on that. Um, I was promised I'd have something tonight in an informational letter but uh, it's 745 and my email box is empty so maybe it will be coming later on but um, 
some good stuff happening with that, some great stuff through technology, some great stuff as far as um, long-term environmental uh, you know, supports for our buildings. And it has been a great injection. And honestly, without those funds, um, we would not have been able to do all the different things that's allowed us to stay open the length of time that we have, especially with those substitutes. Uh, so we right now, uh, we are continuing on with uh, local funds with the substitutes. I know we've had a chance to talk about that a couple times until we receive official notification of what's gonna happen with CARES and what happens with CRF. And then we'll share with finance and the board um, how we fund those moving forward. So I know a lot of information. I talked really quickly, uh, but I think my talk actually matched the frenetic pace that's been going on here, <laughs> making sure that we are spending all of those funds uh, and, and to serve the needs of, of the staff and students in RSU 14. Thank you very much. Um, of course, we were all involved in this, but it's good to hear it all put together like that and great information for everybody. Does anyone have any questions? Great. I'm glad to, the, the substitutes were terrific. I, I, and I want to thank them also. Okay, we're moving on to the district amended calendar discussion. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Janie, and then um, let board members weigh in. I'm thinking back to, um, I think it was the first week of August where all of us were in the auditorium and we had a discussion about what the calendar was. And I think the board at that time, I don't think I know the board at that time voted that we would start the year in hybrid. Uh, remember at that time, Cumberland County initially had been green in the rating system and we made the decision based on social distancing guidelines as well as all the different PPE guidelines and even some of the meeting space guidelines that uh, there was no way that we could fully open our schools and that we needed to open in a hybrid. And so at that time, the board approved a calendar that went through the end of October. And, and one of the discussions we had at that time, it was interesting that many districts were communicating that it was their hope that by Columbus Day weekend that they would be back full and open. Well, we, we've not reached that point. Um, so end of October came, the board voted that we would extend the calendar through the end of the semester, stay in the hybrid because things hadn't changed. Well, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks and it was the post Thanksgiving kind of ramp up was that cases in our state of increase. Uh, I think if we go back to October or even September, September we were looking at anywhere between 20 and 30 cases a day statewide. Uh, things started to ramp up end of October. And then as we got into November, case numbers started to rise. I think we were, uh, I think we were all surprised when we hit 100 and then we hit 200 and then we hit 300 and then 400, 500. And I think we had one day before we left for break that was close to 700 cases. Uh, it was also the time in late December where Cumberland County, which had been green throughout the entire spring, uh, went to yellow and under yellow that recommendation to be hybrid. Um, so our calendar officially stops based upon what you approve for hybrid and based on my recommendation at the end of January. Um, I can't come before you tonight and say anything has changed statewide that would then say we can open in anything other than hybrid. Um, it is not a possibility. And uh, depending upon where cases go across the state, uh, if cases continue to ramp up, there's a chance that at some point we may have to go to remote or that a building may have to go to remote, but um, I don't see us in the very near future being able to go the other direction to green um, in which we'd be able to, to stay open. So it just, it would be my recommendation that uh, we continue in hybrid and that we continue that through March of 2021, um, I, which is the end of March, who knows what's gonna happen. We've not seen a vaccine plan we don't know what the impact of vaccines are gonna be on schools for this year. Um, and so that's where we're at at the moment. 
is um, maintaining that traditional or that AB schedule that we're that we're currently in. So Chris, I guess what I'm just need some explanation on is as far as voting on the calendar, like what's different with the calendar between whether we're hybrid or whether we're in person or whether we're fully remote. I mean, they're all considered school days, correct? Correct. So I'm just wondering what we're changing on the calendar or what we're voting about and if this is even necessary. Um, I think the, we had made the decision early on that the board would just take a vote on what mode that we would continue to operate in. And so there was a vote taken in August. There was a vote taken in October to continue on. It's, I think it's more procedural, Pete, than anything else. But you're right, the calendar is the calendar. All right, so it's more about voting what the mode is, not voting on the calendar. Correct. All right. Christina? I'm just curious as to why we're only extending it through March. I would be shocked if anything changes between now and then. Um, I, I would guess that, that most community members feel the same way and expect this to go on, but it might be nice for people. Um, I know in these past handful of months when I'm rescheduling all the things that were canceled months, months out, you know, it would be nice to have a little more security for people maybe to say, this is definitely when my kid will be in school. This is definitely when they won't be. So it's your um, proposal that we uh, say that hybrid is extended to um, the end of the year. The end of the year. Okay. I think that's realistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with you, Christina. Find myself to March. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking a similar thing, either that or until further notice. Do you know what I mean? So we really wouldn't see it again unless there was a change. I mean, if all of a sudden everything got like wonderful and everybody went back, which we don't think is gonna hurry in a hurry, but yeah. But either one, either what you know, either we go to the end of the year or just until further notice. I, I think it'd be a, to me, it'd be the same thing. But that's what I was going to say. But Christine is right. I agree. Does anyone else have any comments about that? Because it will form our um, um, motion next week for next time. Any? Um, I can't imagine having a significant change to think about in person for everybody every day. So um, yeah, I think it would be really important just to go ahead and let the families be able to plan more. So saying hybrid till the end of the year would be a smart thing. Okay. Scott? Um, I'm sure this is probably gonna come as a shock to pretty much everybody, but I'm gonna be opposed to this. Um, I feel like I'm trying to be a little bit optimistic here. Um, I don't think that planning is really going to significantly impact a lot of people here. I mean, at this point, I think a lot of people are already kind of assuming that we are going to be um, in hybrid throughout the duration of the year. Why, do, why are we rubber stamping this? I, I feel like that's what we're kind of doing here. I, I, I want to try and be a little optimistic. I'm sure that the, there's a lot of other people that would like to try and be a little optimistic. Um, and we just reassess. I don't think it's really a big deal if we just come back, um, you know, the second week, uh, the second meeting in March and extend it if we need to. I, I don't, I don't want to rubber stamp this. You don't want to rubber stamp the idea of um, going into June. Right. I, that's correct. I don't want to, I, I don't want to just say, you know what, we're just going to, um, we're just going to uh, do hybrid model throughout the rest of the year, just because planning is going to be easier for families. Because I honestly, I, I don't see anybody making a whole lot of plans right now. So I don't think that that's really impacting families at this point. Okay. Anna. 
Um, I just, I would vote in favor of it also making that plan through the end of the school year. Um, I think it makes sense. I think, um, you know, to Scott's point, it's an assumption we're all making anyways. So let's make it official and let's have some semblance of being able to carry on with the, uh, the plans at hand. Um, so yeah, if, if we were to move forward with that, I would definitely be in favor and I would vote for through the end of the school year for sure. It's something we can always come back and say, hey, look at this amazing thing that happened overnight. We can all go back to school in person should that happen. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's a, a really solid idea. It gives some stability to all the kids that are wondering what's going on. It gives some stability to the families. Um, and it does allow for us to plan for things like doctor's appointments and you know, things like that. Dentist when they're rarely open. Um, Jenny was next. Yep. Um, and I don't think it's just about the families and planning things. It's about the science. Uh, we've never seen COVID numbers as bad as they are right now. And it wasn't just, it didn't just happen in, in a couple of weeks to turn this around enough to be able to change our, our school district plans significantly to have students in class every day would take a miracle, not just everybody, you know, somehow being able to get vaccinated, which would be a miracle in the next couple of weeks. Um, the science is not with us. And that's more realistic than anything else. Yes, I'm optimistic. I know we're gonna get a vaccine. I, I'm really truly hoping that next year will be somewhat normal. Um, but I think having some security about knowing the rest of the school year is going to be in a certain way for families, doctors, visits, et cetera. I know, you know, I take care of my mom and stuff like that. Planning ahead, yeah, you still have to do those things. I appreciate the being positive and optimistic, but the science isn't with us right now, sorry to say. Kate Levier. Sorry, took me a second. Um, I, I, I guess I, what would be wrong with putting language that just says until further notice, instead of saying until the end of the school year, because we are all saying here, we are assuming it's going to be until the end of the school year, which I, I do think so, but I also agree with Scott. It, it, why, why rubber stamp it in January um, instead of just saying until further notice? And, and I'm someone who I have planned lots of doctors and dentists and various appointments around assuming there's a hybrid model still. Um, take for example, January 22nd, Paige is my daughter's on the A group and she has school now on that Friday. Well. I, if I had, you know, that's something that was you know, relatively new, um, but I worked around it. You know, I mean, you see what I'm saying? Even adding that Friday was relatively new for some of us. I had stuff that we had planned for Friday and even adding that as a remote day, but I've been able to, I think the name of the game right now is being really flexible with things. So um, I, I would lean more towards just putting until further notice. Okay, well, if, I think what we'll do is we'll discuss it tomorrow at leadership and uh, bring a motion to you next week or next time um, and um, and then see how we go from there. That's okay with everyone. Did you have a comment to make, Mr. Howell? No, what, not whatsoever. Okay. Not what's, I'm, I'm trying to be as hopeful with this whole pandemic as possible and I'm trying to stay as, as a cup full as possible, but um, yeah. you know, 2021 is gonna be a great year and let's just keep it at that. Right. Um, Jen Potter always uh, answer, puts on the bottom of her um, emails onward. And I think that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Okay, well, we'll discuss this and bring it to you in the form of a motion next week. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Molly. Before we move on. Yes. Um, I like the idea of having it be until further notice. Um, as a student, I think if you're putting it as hybrid, you can't have that 
like I think what's pushing some kids is knowing that there's a still a possibility of going back full even if it's just like a big dream but if you're capping it at only being hybrid for the rest of the year you can really only go down from there so even if it's not actually going to happen leaving it as a possibility might leave a little more optimism in some students eyes to keep them wanting to try in school and move forward so that's a great point molly thanks and one i hadn't considered so that's great. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Could I have a motion on the report of the secretary? I move to approve the minutes of the December 2nd, 2020 meeting. Second. It's been moved and seconded by, I didn't see, Marge. Uh, any public comment? Becca? Hi, JD. Do you know if there will be a plan for any further um, assessment, inventory, survey, et cetera, of um, staff? Uh, the last survey that was conducted as part of the curriculum committee's work around um, COVID related issues happened during conference time. And so a lot of people didn't even really process the email. The questions were embedded in the body of the email. and. Um, the meeting that we were invited to was held at a time when many of us still had students. So um, I've been asked if there's a plan for another opportunity for people to share um, how they're feeling and what they need. I don't know that there is, but I am, I will find out. unless somebody wants to comment. Yep, ab absolutely. We can, um, we also wanna get some feedback on some other things, so. Okay, um, any uh, board discussion? Here, here. I think we need to hear more from our teachers and staff. Um, always for that. Okay, any other board discussion? Thank you. So all in favor? Kate Bricks? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Marge Gavoni? Yes. Pete Hensler? Aye. Anna Keeney? Yes. Kate Levier? Yes. Scott McLean? Yay. Christina Small? Yes. Could I have a second motion? I move to approve the minutes of the December 16th, 2020 meeting. Second. Second. It's been moved by Anna, seconded by Jenny. Uh, any public comment? Any board discussion? Marge. I, I had sent an email, but I, I really wanted to comment again that I think the um, the way these minutes were written on the 16th were excellent. Uh, it was concise, uh, had a lot of information in it. I think it was great. I really I really liked it. I liked the format. That's my um, only comment. I want to thank um, Kate uh, Bricks and uh, Christine Bertinet Frost Bertinet for. Um, having a discussion about it and and um, and doing it. I really uh, I appreciate the format as well. Um, any other comments about the mm -hmm. format? Hey, Anna, <laughs> it looks like your dog is talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I have to say, I also really loved this format. It was, it's far easier. It jogs the memory, it gets me on track. Um, a lot better um, than our, our usual one. So I'm, I'm a huge fan. If we can make this happen regularly, that would be really awesome. <laughs> Great, that's, I agree. Mr. McLean. Um, Christine, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the, the response seems to be pretty good uh, with the minutes. How much longer did it take you to do these minutes? <laughs> I've been taking minutes as this meeting has been happening, Scott. 
Okay. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll just do a proofread and send them off to Terry. Um, that's it. It doesn't. It's sort of the thing. It's an English teacher trick. I'm listening and writing. It helps me uh, with with everything. All right. Fantastic. Because I was really worried after reading these that it took you at least two and a half hours or so the following Thursday morning to draft all of these. No, I appreciate that. Nope. I'm, okay. I'm, they're almost done. When we wrap up here tonight, we'll send as them off. As long as it's not too impactful for you, then yeah, I'm I'm all for um, doing these uh, types of detailed minutes. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I say okay too much. All set to vote? Yes. Kate Bricks? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Marge Gavoni? Yes. Pete Hensler? Aye. Anna Keeney? Yes. Kate Levier? Yes. Scott McLean? Yay. And Christina Small? Yes. All righty then, <laughs> the motion carries. Um, it's now time for committee reports. Does any committee have a report? Utilities is not met. Met on the 16th prior to uh, school board meeting then. Um, it was a kind of an abbreviated meeting. Uh, we had three items on the agenda. The first is we uh, do what we normally do, looking over the revenue and the expenses. And once again, as with the previous month, we're tracking right where we need to be. Um, the second item was uh, the finance committee kind of got a sneak preview of the audit presentation that was happening right after the meeting. So uh, we kind of did a little deeper dive into some of the things that were brought up um, during the presentation on the audit. And then Lastly, the third item was just um, in preparing to review the cost sharing formula. Uh, we're just kind of setting out a process and a time frame. And so first step on that is on the 20th of this month, uh, prior to that school board meeting, the finance committee uh, will be having another meeting, basically a um, cost sharing 101, just to, uh, so that we can all really understand what the components are that go into it, uh, some of the factors that influence it, and just uh, start doing our work uh, to make sure that there's the fairest method going forward and whether any adjustments are needed. Thanks, Pete. Um, for curriculum, I want to say that um, as a result of the interest um, expressed by the board, um, the A team is going to do a deep dive into um, the data from the math. Uh, tests that we've been doing, assessments that we've been doing. Christine, do you want to comment upon that? She's, I mean, but let me just continue and then I'll turn it over to you. She's going to um, report to the curriculum committee and then, um, and then we will do that in some form to you. So Christine. Sure, um, what we're, because of the investment and the time and professional development that we've used on the iReady diagnostic, we now have fall to fall comparison, which I um, shared at the achievement report, um, but we're taking a, a deeper dive into that. Um, all our administrators um, spent some time this week with the iReady team, um, and we are setting up professional targeted development, looking at our own scores and seeing where our scores are in um, correlation to national scores and having some really nice things to celebrate about what we're doing in the RSU. Uh, we're preparing right now for the winter diagnostic, which will give us an opportunity to just really take the, the new temperature of where kids are because what happens when they take the new diagnostic is it actually um, puts them in their pathway. It upgrades where they are if needed. So it's constantly adjusting um, and then we can look at see how our, our students have grown or pieces we need to help with um, instruction from this hybrid or 100% remote model. Um, so I think it'll be a great opportunity for us to just update and go a little uh, deeper with um, how the curriculum looks in the area of mathematics. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Well then, it's time for board roundtable. If you have an opportunity to address the community, offer congratulations, school news. Anyone? Pete. 
Uh, well, it was none of those things, but we have used the round table to talk about items. Um, I was just curious, at our last meeting, uh, where Dr. Nickerson presented to us, and from that we uh, thought that something needed to be done from the board. Um, it was unfortunate timing that shortly after that meeting, we went to yellow and all extracurricular activities are placed on pause, but um, did anything come out of that in terms of a board letter being sent to the state or any talk about that at the leadership meetings? I, I can jump in first, Pete, um, which I'll share in my superintendent's report. Um, Dr. Nickerson and I are gonna do a shared letter together uh, to our legislative group. Uh, so we've met on that, we're gonna co-draft it. And um, one of the things that was interesting as we met is I think Maine is one of the only states or might be the only state that's not allowing coral uh, right now. So we're working on a draft together and we'll do that. We've not had a chance to talk about a, from the board. I mean, I think also the timing with break uh, kind of hit us, but um, I think that's kind of a step we need to talk about. And I would like to apologize in public again that I missed the highlighted section on my agenda, which says superintendent's report. I'm going to have to put glitter on it, which is first grade way to uh, highlight stuff. So does anyone else have anything to add? Um, Jenny? I was going to ask about the follow up for that also. Um, and once the information is, uh, the letter is done, I think it would certainly be wise to send it to the education committee at the um, state level. Um, there are a couple of people on that that I do know. So that would be a great way to go ahead and, and uh, pass that along. Uh, I also wonder with the, and maybe you're gonna talk about it in your superintendent's report, sports potentially or not because of yellow or going into the rest of the winter. And the, the other thing is uh, the impact for adult ed. Are we going to be getting a report or information regarding adult ed? Um, they've got new stuff, new semester starting, new courses starting. And it just, I think would be a great idea to hear from adult ed. That's it. I think we have that, but we have that in the um, in the plans, but it's not right away. Marge, um, back on just added to the um, the coral thing. Um, are you in that letter? Is it basically across the board? And I'm thinking of uh, like Nancy Cash Cobb and over at the Manchester. Um, you know, the younger kids? It, it would be anything Coral okay. in 14. Okay. Uh, there was some recent language that came out and some guidance for you to ban. Remember, we talked about the slip right. maps and it's actually called a water valve um, disposal area, not a spit valve. I, I was corrected on that. So uh, there is some language and some additional bells and um, bell covers for instruments that are, that are being discussed. Okay, thank, thanks. I think Kate really liked that split mass, the whole spit bell thing. Scott, Scott, <laughs> the one who liked that. Okay, now could we have the superintendent's report, please? Sure, and I will start, first of all, Jenny, with your question about sports. Uh, the MPA Sports Medicine Committee voted this morning to um, initially, there was some discussion around the state that if a county was yellow to still allow some sort of level of practice. Uh, Sports Medicine Committee, though, voted this morning that yellow means red and to continue to make the recommendation that districts now who are under yellow that continue on with sports are halted. That also includes community sports as well, which is not under the MPA, but uh, those are all halted as well. So at this point, uh, as long as we're yellow, those continue our, as I think I shared on the board in my superintendent's notes, um, our coaches are still remaining engaged. And it's important that they do um, remain engaged with our kids and helping them with individual workouts and such. But um, 
there is no organized practices that are going on right now in Cumberland County and York County as well. Um, other counties, the state is, might be as well. Uh, going back though to Dr. Nickerson, uh, we'll, we'll share a draft with that before. We're hoping to get that out here in the next couple of weeks to be able to get that. Um, uh, Kate Levier, thank you for bringing up the reminder of in the last approved calendar, January 22nd, since A Day Kids with Monday Holidays, that is a school day. It went out in a communication, I think, in November to families. We'll be recommunicating that this week uh, to make sure that people are planning for that. Um, also received some questions lately about vaccinations. Um, and right now I've not heard any plans from the state. I know all of our staff fall in the 1B category. Um, I, the only exception to that are our school nurses, that there's some movement to get them into the one. Initially they were in a 1A part B, uh, but there's some movement right now to get them into 1A so that they can be uh, fully taken care of. And then the last thing I'll share, which I think um, all of us now are becoming more and more familiar with um, outbreak language and um, pandemic language. In fact, a meeting with a high school social studies teacher the other day, and she said, teaching the plague is now eas more easier than ever because kids are now used to all these different terms. Uh, but I think one of the things that all of you are now used to is that when you have three or more cases, that are attributed to a building over a 14 day period, then an outbreak investigation is um, opened up for that particular building. Uh, so I'm saying that because um, I'd shared with board members that uh, Manchester School had three cases that happened over break. They weren't attributed to anything that happened during school time, but since they're attributed to Manchester and they had attended Manchester School within the last 14 days, um, that Manchester School will be uh, an outbreak investigation, will be open for Manchester. We learned that late this afternoon, um, the main CDC and other cases we've had, we've had a notification, a phone call, and then there's been a follow-up Zoom meeting. Um, there won't be a follow-up Zoom meeting because as all of you know, and as I've shared with the community, all these cases happened outside the virulence period, the time of contraction happened outside of school, but since it's attributed to Manchester School, so Dr. Shaw will announce officially on Friday that um, Manchester an outbreak investigation, much like it's been announced for Wyndham Primary School, uh, Wyndham Middle School, that there's been outbreak investigations of those. Uh, I've not had a chance this afternoon to start working on a community letter. I will have one ready in the morning and I'll get that out so that the community will know well, well ahead of time of the Friday communication. So this saves an email to all of you um, about that particular change. And um, we will continue to work with the main CDC. And again, if you go into outbreak status, any new cases get reviewed by the CDC. And what specifically they're looking for, is there any sort of transmission happening in your buildings? Uh, and with Manchester, when people weren't actually in school, when transmission happened, um, that's an easy one to investigate, but it's part of their protocol. So it's a, it's a reality of our times right now, uh, but that will be uh, an additional outbreak school for us. Thank you. Great, could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Anybody? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. It's been second by nine people and uh, no. Make a pick. <laughs> uh, moved by Scott. All those in favor? Kate Bricks? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Marge Cavoni? Yes. Pete Hensler? Aye. Anna Keeney? Yes. Kate Levier? Yes. Scott McLean? Yay. And Christina Small? Yes. Only took me nine months to start reading that from a sheet. <laughs> <laughs> We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>